Hi, I'm Carl Azus. Thank you for taking 10 for CNN 10. U.S. military officials are investigating a terrorist attack that happened in northern Syria Wednesday. U.S. Central Command says four Americans were killed. Two were U.S. service members, one was a civilian with the Department of Defense, and one was a DOD contractor. The attack apparently took place while U.S. troops were on a routine patrol in the city of Manbij. And the terrorist group ISIS, which stands for Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, claimed it was responsible. It said the assault was carried out by a suicide bomber wearing explosives. The U.S. has about 2,000 troops serving in Syria. Before Wednesday's attack, two American service members have been killed in action there since the current operation began in 2014. The attack happened less than a month after U.S. President Donald Trump announced that American troops would leave the Middle Eastern country and that ISIS was beaten badly. Kurdish military leaders in Syria say troops can push ISIS out of towns, but that northern Syria is still filled with sleeper cells, small groups of terrorists that live quietly in an area until they're ordered to attack. Officials say the threat from them is very hard to get rid of. About 2,600 miles south in the African nation of Kenya, there was another terrorist attack this week that killed at least 21 people in the capital of Nairobi. Oh it started after a car bomb went off Tuesday afternoon, followed by an assault by several gunmen on a hotel complex. This attack was claimed by Al-Shabaab, an Islamist militant group based in neighboring Somalia. The assault lasted for hours before Kenyan security forces, quote, eliminated all the terrorists. Dozens of people were injured, and Kenya's president says more than 700 were safely evacuated. Tourism is an important part of Kenya's economy, and terrorist attacks have hurt the industry in the past. 10-second trivia. In which of these nations is Romanche an official language? Austria, Italy, Romania, or Switzerland? Romanche is spoken in a region of eastern Switzerland and is one of the country's four official languages. The World Economic Forum is getting ready to meet next week in Davos. That's a resort in eastern Switzerland. It's the 49th annual meeting of the group. It brings together thousands of the world's political and business leaders. And one big goal of the forum is to promote and develop globalization when international businesses and governments become more closely connected. It's a controversial issue, and it's not supported by everyone who's attended the forum. High in the Swiss Alps amid the breathtaking vistas and pristine air, the Davos dream of global connectivity and cooperation is facing a bumpy ride. Some say it may be downhill from here for the Davos elite. The vision of Davos, which is that everybody's coming together, has really been shattered over the last year. There are so many issues facing globalization right now. In fact, it's hard to think of something positive for globalization. Good evening. And what a year it's been since the last Davos. From anti-elite yellow vest protests in France to populist wins at the ballot box in Brazil, Mexico and Italy. And strongmen consolidating power in countries like Turkey and Hungary. It's not just America first. Make America great again, right? It's the fear of every nation out for itself everywhere. In Davos, you're probably going to hear a lot about a tripolar world. U.S. is going one direction, Europe is going another, and China and some of the emerging markets are going a third. But Davos won't be all doom and gloom. Yes, global growth may be slowing, but the U.S. economy is on solid footing. I think we're actually in a good place. And certain central bankers are saying they'll be patient. The big hope, of course, the possibility of a U.S.-China trade deal coming this year, too. And there's going to be the usual discussion about technology, disruption and innovation. After a rough 2018, it could be tough going. Davos man and Davos women are simply hoping to stay on their feet. Julia Chasley, CNN. Plant burgers, bean burgers, veggie burgers, there's no shortage of companies trying to develop alternatives to meat. What about sushi, specifically tuna made without tuna fish, but instead from tomatoes, sesame oil, and soy sauce? Some foodies say serious sushi sticklers may not spring for it, but several others have. When it comes to seafood, are there more than fish in the sea? The human population is growing exponentially. In 1800, they were about a billion people on Earth. 
Today, there's more than seven times that. And by 2100, estimates say there could be nearly 12 billion people around the globe. That rapid growth comes with lots of problems. One of the biggest, our food supply may not be able to keep up. When it comes to seafood, the rising number of consumers mixed with the growing popularity of foods like sushi has led to overfishing. The Pacific bluefin tuna is a sushi staple. Its population has fallen 97%. Demand is only getting higher and higher and higher, and one of the big problems we have today is that um, we are overfishing tuna, and it's only at 3% at the height of its stock. That's James Corwell. He's been a chef for over 30 years, and he's the founder of a company called Ocean Hunger Foods. His solution to the dwindling tuna population? Tomatoes. Stay with me. There's five tastes. So we have, we're familiar with sweet, sour, salty, bitter. But there's the fifth taste called umami, right. and that refers to savory. In sushi in particular, you have soy sauce, you have rice that's high in umami, you have seaweed that's high in umami, you have the tuna that's high in umami. But also that what's high in umami are tomatoes. The only problem was is you wouldn't have a great sushi experience if the ahimi tastes like tomatoes. So the real technology that we developed uh, came from uh, the process on how to remove that tomato flavor, uh, yeah, keep great texture, but create this kind of neutral platform in which to carry Japanese flavors or Latin American flavors or Mediterranean flavors. So it's basically like the tomato is a vehicle to get those flavors into your mouth. Exactly. Ocean Hugger makes plant-based alternatives to seafood. The tomato tuna is called ahimi. The company is also working on salmon made from carrots and eel made from eggplant. Well, now let's dig in there. All right, okay, all right, all right. And we're gonna dip in a little of the soy sauce. It really does look like tuna. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Yeah. That's really good. All right now, let's go, let's have it in sushi roll form. Uh, I'm not very good with chopsticks. I mean. I would totally, totally grab this for lunch as opposed to the regular yeah. tuna. I don't have to worry about the mercury. I don't have to worry about like, you know, killing mm -mm. Uh, delicious salt tuna. Pie. So I was pleasantly surprised. I mean, it actually tasted good. But if we look even further into the future, there will be less usable land to grow crops like tomatoes and carrots. That's where some scientists think algae comes in. Yep, algae like pond scum. It might not sound very appetizing, but algae is actually high in protein, and it can grow where other crops can't. All you need is sunlight, air, and water. We're not in dire need of algae-based snacks just yet, but one company called Nonfood wants to get ahead of the curve. Oh, it smells. Their first product is called Non Bar, and instead of trying to emulate flavors we already know and love, they decided to embrace the algae. So I'm gonna try this. Smells a little funky, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it's gonna take some getting used to. <laughs> On Twitter, the city of Westbrook, Maine says it looks like the moon has landed. If you don't know what this is, we'll pause it for a second so you can take a guess. Okay, give up? It's an ice disc that formed in a river that passes through the city. It's 100 yards in diameter. It's natural, but scientists say it's pretty rare, and that this one likely rotates the way it does because the current of the passing water pushes it that way. So if you're where it's brisk and you stumble on a disc, do not take a risk and let it take you for a whisk. The ice is pretty thin, you won't want to take a spin, it may give you quite a grin, but you could fall right in. So take it all right in, make our show begin again, it's to no one's chagrin, watched on CNN 10. When it comes to ice, keeping distance is quite wise, it's far better you just view it than maybe fall right through it. I'm Carla Zeus, and that's all we have to discuss on CNN. 